I'm Arash. I work at Netflix, and we've uh, noticed several problems in the FreeBSD I.O. stack dealing with back pressure due to our, the way we use FreeBSD in our OCMs. So I thought I'd talk about that. If you want to grab a copy of my slides um, and follow along at home, they're at the URL that's on the screen. I'll give you a second to grab that while I get some tea from my throat. <clears throat> so there's three parts to my talk today. The first part, I'll talk a little bit about how Netflix uses FreeBSD as is relevant to the rest of the talk. Um, this could be an entire talk all on its own, so it'll be abbreviated. If you have questions about what I don't cover, feel free to see me or anybody else that's working at Netflix. I'll then give an overview of the upper layers of the FreeBSD I.O. stack. Um, <clears throat> that will tell you um, hopefully what you need to know. And I see we have several experts in that in the room. Hopefully I'll be getting it right. It's always embarrassing when Kirk raises his hand and goes, no, that's not quite right. Um, and then I'll talk about my work on back pressure. Um, I had hoped to present some extensive results about that uh, in this talk, but due to an emergency at work, uh, the results will be a little bit abbreviated. So the uh, FreeBSD stack overview will be a little bit longer than I had anticipated. So I work for Netflix. Um, I assume everybody here has heard about Netflix and know what they are. We deliver. Um, yeah, we mail out DVDs, and uh, I, I hear we have uh, streaming soon, whatever that is. Um, so we have internet video that uh, streams out from hundreds of different servers. Um, as we grew up, we overwhelmed all the content distribution networks out there, so we built our own. So. Uh, the reason we built our own is we have between 30 and 40 percent of the peak internet traffic according to Sandvine, depending on which year you look at, which report. Um, the picture here is of uh, some of our storage servers at one of our colos uh, from a couple years ago, slightly older model, uh, but the newer model looks just the same. I think they paint them, the cases red now for the storage um, to kind of brand them as Netflix. Uh, we stream multiple terabits a second, every second, every day. Um, and the individual machines, our fastest one currently is about 100, uh, 90 or 100 gigabits uh, at uh, saturation. The way Netflix works briefly is um, you're interacting with the Netflix app, whether it's on your phone, your tablet, uh, your browser, your TV, um, it's talking to uh, an instance in the uh, Amazon Cloud uh, to do all our front end information. Do you have an account? You know, what movies are good for you? Uh, all of that stuff, all of the browsing and recommendations is all handled through that. So as you hit play, the cloud tells your browser or your um, app, get the movie from this URL. And then it contacts the Open Connect device, which is just a glorified web server. All we do is serve a lot of content uh, through, the, through HTTPS. And we do this through a number of different OCA types. We have a fairly large catalog that won't even fit in one of our appliances. It's tens of uh, terabytes in size. The storage appliance uh, is, has a bunch of spinning disks. It stores most of our content. And it stores it very well. It has a small uh, number of SSDs to enhance the uh, streaming for the most popular content. But when something's really popular, we go to the next tier in our uh, OCA type, which is a flash appliance, which is purely, purely flash based. It's either 40 gig with SSDs or 100 gig with NVMe cards. And 
we put the most popular content on here and stream it out as quickly as possible. We uh, locate as many, replicate the content as many times as necessary to get the bandwidth that our customers need. We do this and we place these boxes close to our customers so we don't overwhelm the rest of the internet. Plus, the further hops you have to traverse for a video stream, the higher quality, um, better experience you get from a video stream. We also have kind of a box in the middle right now. It's our global appliance, where it has some hard disks, some SSDs, so that the most popular content from smaller catalogs in other parts of the world uh, is able to stream from that, and the full catalog comes off of the hard disks. Um, and we're also looking at mixing and matching these in any of the combinations possible. Um, our hardware guy that um, creates the servers likes to buy NAND very cheaply and where the speed, st sweet spot is on the NAND varies and also what NAND is available varies. Um, I could do an entire talk on NAND logistics, but it's not why you guys came here and I'd probably fall asleep in the middle of it too. So um, the important thing to note here is that we're looking at having uh, boxes that have three different store, uh, classes of storage. Uh, sorry, performance classes. Um, hard disks operate at about 10 to 100 milliseconds in terms of the time it takes them to process events depending on how loaded they are, how big the transfers are. And um, the fastest NVMe drives can be microseconds. So that's a few orders of magnitude, depending on how you count uh, four, five, six orders of magnitude in speed differential of storage all on the same box. In addition, we found that our SSDs have wildly varying performance. If we're riding along, it can be fine, and then all of a sudden the performance drops by a, a tenth. I mean, to a tenth. It'll go from being three, four, 500 megabytes a second to 30, 40, 50 megabytes a second. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. I talked about some of them in um, uh, prior BSD CAN talk, but um, generally what happens today is the drives are based on what's called TLC NAND, which gets great density by storing three bits per cell, but is super slow. Um, they can operate the NAND in multiple modes. Um, including an SLC mode, which is really fast. So they devote a few percent of their drive capacity to SLC pages. As you're writing out, it buffers them in this SLC cache. And then after you're done writing, um, they'll move it to another part of the drive that has higher capacity. And if you're writing in bursts, this makes the drive look like it performs really, really well. But um, we write bursts that are larger than this cache when we're filling our content, putting new content on the machines. So we overwhelm it. So we'll see this performance change. Everything's fine, three, 400 megabytes a second, and then boom, everything's not fine and performance really is terrible. And any of the tuning that we had done for 300 megabytes a second um, doesn't work so well at, at, at 30 megabytes a second. Um, also, the nature of NAND flash is such that um, as you're writing to it, you erase it and then write once. Well, if you're rewriting pages, that creates holes um, earlier in the what's called the, the device log, which is append only with uh, the data and a little tag saying where, what the m logical mapping of that data is. So when you rewrite the data further on in the log, prior in the log, it creates holes. And if you're writing too much, um, you can overwhelm any uh, pool of uh, NAND box that it has, and it has to find them somewhere. And the only way it can find them is by reading the old NAND pages that have holes, writing them at the end of the log to collapse out the holes, and then it has pages. But it's doing this activity instead of your workload, which impacts performance. Um, and then once it does this, performance might be fine again. Um, we've also found that the performance varies even when the drive isn't misbehaving, we find that the performance varies significantly with the workload. If we're doing 100% or 99% read workload, we can get 
maybe 500 megabytes a second out of the drives. But even a 10% write workload drops that down to about 400. And if you um, do a 50-50 workload, it drops it down to 100. So it's not even a linear progression. And as the, the workload changes, what you can expect out of the drive changes. Um, and since we have basically two periods for our servers, we have a fill period where we're writing data and sometimes serving traffic. You can do, fill, you can do that on our storage machines, um, but not on our flash machines. Um, once you um, are doing that, the, the, the capacity you have to serve customers drops a lot because your read rates drop a lot. In fact, on the flash, it drops so much, we just have to turn off serving customers while we're filling in content. Um, also, with having hard disks and NVMe drives in the same system, or hard disks and SSDs in the same system, um, they have very different performance characteristics. Hard disks tend to be dominated by the number of IOs you want to do to them. Um, because between each I.O. it has to move the head, and that time dominates the I.O. time that you're going to have. So as you're moving the head around, um, the number of things you want to get tends to dominate. If you read 100K, oh, stop that. If you read 100K versus reading um, a megabyte or two megabytes or eight megabytes, um, you'll get about the same number of IOPS. Your bandwidth will vary considerably. But with Flash, since there's no moving parts, um, unless you're doing really, really tiny transactions, after the transaction size gets above about 32 or 64K, bandwidth dominates. So you, for different systems, you would want to tune it for bandwidth or for IOPS. But if you have a system that has both types of drives in it, it's, it's hard to tune it for both at the same time. So, this is some of the motivation that led me to do the back pressure work. Um, some of the problems that we found um, in FreeBSD, the buffer cache winds up scheduling all of the I.O. I'm going to put a big asterisk to it, except for the parts it doesn't. But generally speaking, all the I.O. goes through the buffer cache. And the buffer cache, um, particularly in writing, tries to be very nice to the uh, lower layers. If you're doing a synchronous write, it'll let that through because you're going to wait and not schedule very many writes. But if you're doing asynchronous writes, it limits the number of those asynchronous writes that you can do. And if you have a single disk system, this works fairly well. Um, it's a global limit, and a global limit with one disk, you don't run into any problems. But if you've got a global limit and you've got hard disks that are slow and SSD drives that are fast, one can starve the other. If you get a bunch of requests out to a hard disk, then your SSDs won't write for a while. If you get a bunch of requests on the SSDs and they're churning through and, 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 and cranking through quickly, you can starve the, the hard disks. Depending, just depends on the order of arrival. Um, so, so that's one of the problems that we've seen. Uh, another problem. Uh, is that as you're getting ready to write, the system limits the number of buffers that can be dirty at any given time. And if you want to write and there's too many dirty buffers, you wait for the buffers to be cleaned. And they're cleaned by the buffer daemon. And um, although not the topic of this talk, um, Isilon and some other people have been working to make that more efficient. One of the problems is it does a, has a high low water mark to do the work, uh, which makes it uh, bursty to the lower layers. Burstiness isn't very good to the lower layers. It tends to overwhelm them. You tend to tie up more resources. Anytime you create a situation where I.O. is delayed at the lower levels because too much is queued up or because you can't do very much I.O., you've got all the pages that are locked. You've got other resources that are uh, consumed by that until that blockage or that backup can, can clear. And we found that. Uh, a couple years ago, I presented on the I.O. scheduler that I had written for CAM, which lets us throttle writes to hard disks, or to any disks, really. We use it for, or we're trying to use it for SSDs. We thought if we could 
limit the amount of data we would write at any time to the SSD, we would get consistent, but not very good, but consistent and predictable performance out of the SSD uh, on writes, and bursts of writes wouldn't affect our read speed. So we would be able to service customers while we're <coughs> filling. And that didn't work uh, as well as we'd hoped. Um, some of that is due to the tooling that we have in our uh, infrastructure that looks at um, the latency and the percent busy metrics. If you schedule something and send it down to the lower layers, it's considered to have a being pending. So DevStat says, oh, the device is busy while you're doing that. Um, even if it's um, delaying to allow other reads or whatever. Um, the other thing is it increases latency. Um, because as you're measuring these things, the stuff that goes down and then delayed, it's going to necessarily increase latency. If you're throttling to a particular rate and you have more than that coming in, the latency is going to go way up. So all of these things have kind of led me to the point where I thought, well, we need to communicate um, some sort of back pressure up the stack. The global limits, we're, we're kind of reaching the end of the usefulness of the global limits. So the work that um, I've done adds that communication to the stack. So before I talk about that, though, I'm going to talk about the FreeBSD I.O. stack. So that where I put this stuff in is uh, more apparent and more understandable. Um, so here's a picture of the FreeBSD I.O. stack conceptually. It's a simplified version from Kirk's and George's and Robert's uh, design and implementation book. And so it's a simplified version. It's, you know, that takes some liberties, but basically um, from top to bottom, you have system calls that ingest the data um, and those map to file entries that map to V nodes um, that go through the file system, that go through the page cache that then goes down to geom and the layers below. Um, I've talked in prior years about the lower layers and this talk will be um, more about the page cache uh, layer. I wanted to include uh, file system parts on that, but that made the talk too long. So I'll be talking a, a little bit about the page cache or the buffer cache um, as well. Um, these are this, the same thing in uh, kind of just describing what these different layers do. Uh, the upper layer buffer stuff, the lower layers then um, transform the data uh, to do RAID and striping and partitioning uh, and um, then the CAM at the lowest level knows how to get the stuff back and forth to devices. Um, I've talked about that in a prior talk uh, so I won't be hitting on it any more than that um, in this talk. So the center of the buffer cache is struct buff um, and basically it maps a V node uh, to memory. Uh, in fact, it maps a particular part of the V node. It has an offset and a length in it, and the pages are generally backed by VM objects, um, or they're not backed by VM objects, and when the system touches them, uh, the VM objects are, it, it, the pages are read in. Um, the VM objects are always there, they're just not populated, I guess. It might be a better way of saying that. Um, and so it has that. It has a number of uh, fields for bookkeeping. You know, is this a delayed write? Is this an asynchronous request? Is it what, what kind of thing is going on here? It also has um, list members. There are active and inactive and wired pages um, that I won't be getting into in, in this talk. Um, but the list, but the buff keeps, uh, object keeps track of that. Um, during the life cycle of the buff, it gets moved from list to list and uh, that's how that's managed. Then there's the buff obj that um, the uh, buff uses 
to tie the different pieces of the system together. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, a little later. Um, there's a done routine, so when the I.O. completes, the requester can get a call back and either schedule more I.O. or return results to the user. Um, and there's also credentials that are based on uh, the process initiating the I.O. So how are the struct buffs used? Um, this array of buffers, which is statically allocated at boot, um, schedules I.O. between the layers. Uh, when it's time to populate the buff or to write out dirty buffs, uh, they are used to communicate um, through all the translation layers. So if it's a file in a file system, uh, it will go through the file system, look up where that file lives on the disk, um, and fill those fields of the buff in, and then schedule that I.O. to the lower layers through the buff option. Uh, it also is used to track read ahead and write behind, or delayed writes. So um, even though the user is writing or reading a few bytes, the system might say, oh, well, the, it's time to read a cluster of pages. This is particularly useful uh, when you're streaming large video files out. If you read ahead a particular amount, that can create larger I.O. transactions down the stack, um, which is beneficial on, say, hard disks. Um, it also caches the most frequent blocks. This can be both good and bad. Uh, if you're a general purpose system and people are running a bunch of executables, having LS cached in memory is a good thing because when somebody types LS, you don't have to hit the disk, it gets the pages out of memory. Um, if you're streaming a bunch of video data, this might not be so good because um, not everybody, there's, there's, there's poor reuse in that case. Um, Buffs are also used when it comes time if you've created anonymous pages um, through malloc um, or through uh, data sections in your executable uh, and there's memory pressure. These get written out to the uh, swap file and can be potentially used for other things. Um, and all the dirty buffers are managed with, uh, by the buffer daemon. The buffer daemon manages the, manages the lists that these, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, the buffer daemon manages the um, dirty buffers that uh, accumulate in the system and tries to keep those numbers uh, low. Um, it runs from time to time and it goes through all the queues that it has. It schedules the buffers to write. It checks the low and high water marks and says, oh, I need to do this much work this time and goes off and does the work. Um, and depending on what the limit is, some of them will block the buffer daemon, particularly if there's a suspended file system. Um, some of them are ignored. One of the problems with the um, static limits is that sometimes you really, really need to write something no matter what has been scheduled. So um, the buffer daemon has special tricks in it to get around uh, the uh, limits imposed by uh, B can write, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the problems with that hack as well. So interacting with the buffer cache, um, there are, are basically four classes of functions. One is to get a new buffer, um, where you can look up a buffer by a V node and offset, or um, get an anonymous buffer if you don't have a V node associated with it. Uh, most of the file systems use bread and bwrite to bring data in and out. Um, bstrategy is the routine that's called uh, to actually schedule the uh, I.O. at the next layer down. 
And usually it's uh, you, the, the strategy routine queues up the request and returns or calls something that queues up the request and returns. It's a non-blocking request. And then there's a number of routines that um, wait for uh, the buffer cache to um, do its thing and return. So the buffage, the buffage ties together uh, the V nodes and the buffs. And um, there's a number of routines that, that it has to, to manage this. It's a very small number, so I th thought I could go through them. Um, again, there's the strategy routine, which calls the next thing down the chain. Um, there's a sync routine, which um, synchronizes all of the buffs associated with this V node. So it's like F-Sync, uh, an F-Sync system call. Um, there's BO write. Even though BO strategy handles reads and writes, there's a separate BO write, which uh, is the thing that calls B can write, which um, does the running buff, make sure there's not too many going on at any given time. And then there's also a um, flush routine, which is a lot like sync, except it does all the buffers for that buffer object. Um, so another part of the buffer cache are pagers. And when I say goes to the next layer, the next layer typically is one of these pagers um, where the data is written out and brought in. Um, So the vnode pager is what handles uh, writing and reading pages that are associated with vnodes. Uh, it's the thing that brings false pages in um, or writes them out uh, when you're trying to do IO to files primarily. Um, the swap pager is used for managing working sets like I was talking about earlier. Uh, and then the other pagers are, um, the default pager does nothing, um, and the other pagers are not used all that much. So trying to pull all this together, and judging from the fact I'm seeing some heads nod, maybe I should have put this first in my talk. But the, the current write path down in the, in the system is um, a system call happens, somebody decides they want to write. So before dirtying a buffer, they call B will write, which checks the dirty count and puts the process to sleep if there's too many dirty buffers to interact with the buffer daemon, um, or to wake up the buffer. It also wakes up the buffer daemon and, and waits for the buffers to be available. Um, some systems have hacked that to do an inline reclamation of a few dirty buffers or to start that off immediately rather than waiting for the buffer daemon to, to wake up. And then once it knows it can proceed. It goes ahead and dirties the buffer by putting the data in there by whatever means. And that there's so many different paths in that how it does that, whether it copies it from user space or swaps pages, is um, a bit long. Um, it calls the buffage uh, write routine so that um, to do the write. And the reason it calls buffage write is so that um, any checks for running buff can be made. Um, that then winds up calling the strategy routine, which schedules the I.O. Um, and that'll bounce around through a, through, lay, through a few layers at the upper system that would make this slide way too hard to read. But um, if you have file systems involved, there's translating to the lower device and so forth that aren't on this. But um, Eventually, I'll get down to GEOM. The GVFS strategy is the entry point to GEOM. That's where it converts the struct buff to the struct bio and does all the stuff. And then once everything's done, we call bio done, and the caller gets a notification that, hey, this is done um, as well. Or sorry, we call buff done. So that's 
kind of the backdrop of the FreeBSD um, I.O. system. So the back pressure design, which is what you guys came here for, I imagine, um, the, the, the conceptually, uh, the high level description is that at the lowest level, each device publishes how much it thinks it can do and the time scale it thinks it can do it on. Um, this is, a, um, I've started adding this to the CAM IO scheduler uh, so it can try to estimate how much is too much IO for a particular disk. I also have one that just is based on static limits for testing. Um, and so right now when you submit an IO from the upper layers, it's fire and forget. You submit it and something happens and either it's submitted or it's not. And um, the something that happens might include sleeping, might include delays, might include other things. But basically, um, it's submitted. No information flows back up the stack to tell the upper layers anything at all about what happened. What I've changed is that the lower levels fill in these completion records or these submission records. There's one of each that tell the upper layers, OK, after you've submitted this I.O., we have this much space available. And, wh and also what the time scale of this device is um, and what the, uh, whether this device is IOP limited or bandwidth limited or both. Um, so that the upper layers can make decisions about either how many um, things to schedule or how much work to schedule. The upper, it's envisioned that the, uh, this is a cooperative scheme. The upper layers know how urgent their I.O. is, and they know um, whether or not they can cheat and use more um, bandwidth, or they need to use more bandwidth than might be available in the next few milliseconds because the need is urgent. Or, oh, I'm only going to use about half of that because the need isn't very urgent right now. They, they can make decisions like that um, based on what they know about their needs for I.O. Um, so the, I've also cr created a few interfaces that allow the upper layers to, to do this, to, to give them the flexibility to, um, to do this. So like I was talking about, the completion layer has um, a couple of things in it. It has the time scale, I'm calling it an IO quantum here, but that's the time scale that the device works best on. For a memory device, that would be nanoseconds. For a hard disk, that might be 50 or 100 milliseconds. Um, it has a bit mask that tells whether or not this record was even filled in, um, as well as what's the limiting factor for this I.O., or both. Um, and then it tells what the limiting factors are. Um, and in this way, it, it communicates up the stack uh, an estimate of uh, what the drives are able to do. Um, for a simple direct dispatch system, this is fairly simple. Um, for a system that has uh, GMIR or GRAID, where uh, the lower layers have to aggregate uh, to different disks, um, or there's networks involved where the, the latency might be changing or different, um, I'm leaving the hard problem of how to fill this in to those layers. You know, does GMIR, is it additive for the reads and writes, or is it just you know, what the worst one of the lower disks can do? I'm leaving that to GMIR. That's kind of a hard problem. Another command that's needed is an IO cap command, and that it gets the capacity of the drive down the stack. And the reason for this is, um, on the previous slide, I said, in a direct dispatch system, this is all easy. Well, not all device drivers support direct dispatch. A lot of them are queued to, to, to G down and then return. Well, it doesn't know what the, the capacity is. So there's a mechanism for getting that capacity um, should the upper layers need it um, on their submission record. Um, 
and it returns the data in the same format as a submission or completion record is the important um, takeaway. Yes, Alan? Based on like a average or? It's based on, yeah, whatever. Um, it's based on whatever the device wants to estimate. And um, this could be a rolling average. This could be some more sophisticated, smooth, filtered average. Um, at this layer, um, it's, this is the, uh, this is the devices or somebody that's managing the device's best guess of what won't overload the device in whatever time frame is present. So I know that's kind of a squishy, you know, eh, just tell us what you can do. But it, but it, it allows also for um, different, it allows for innovation with the different schedulers. Um, it turns out the question of how do you know that the disk is saturated is a hard question. And I didn't want to dictate what that, the answer to that was in doing this. So is there a scheduler where I can just say, I know this is to do this many Yes. Yes, I have a, a simple static scheduler that says, um, this device does this rate. And that's all it does. It doesn't try to estimate or guess. Um, and um, I don't have the results I was hoping to have. Um, I've spent the last month um, working on a high priority item for work rather than generating results for this talk, which I'm kind of embarrassed about, but you know, we have what we have. <laughs> so um, I, I can't tell you how well that would perform. My intuition tells me it probably wouldn't suck because it's not that different than uh, the static limits we have in the system today. Um, there are a couple of flags I added to bio, but they also apply to buffs that tell whether or not this transaction is, is participating in the back pressure. Um, I, for a transition, and, and this code I have now, um, it, one of the problems I talk about in a few minutes is the code is green. How to do the automatic back pressuring for things that haven't been converted is very green right now. But there's a flag that says, don't try to do that. I know what I'm doing. Schedule this and tell me the results. And then I'll manage my workload uh, appropriately. Um, and then there's another flag that says, well, normally where you would sleep when I do an asynchronous request, ah, don't sleep. Just return E again and I'll cope. Um, right now, the, the the different sleeps in the system are designed so that we don't have to put in a bunch of tests and retries. It can be centralized to sleep in one place. But that's also inconvenient if you want to try to be innovative in what you're doing. Um, you don't want the thing to go to sleep. If you want to try to you know, fire, do it or not, I want to know. And not's fine. If the application wants to Yeah, exactly. Or I can tell, you know, I can tell SynFile to slow down or you know, have a smaller read ahead or something, you know, sophisticated like that. We haven't talked about that at Netflix, but, you know, knowing, you know, getting this back pressure, you can apply the back pressure not only up to the layer I've done, but also further, um, possibly in the future. I haven't done any syscalls to get what the back pressure is or anything like that. Um, I don't know what the right interface for that is. Probably something close to our AIO interface. You know, that just adds that information. Um, I have a default I/O scheduler that um, you set limits on, enforces the old limits, and is boring, um, but it's there for testing. Um, oops, okay. I also have um, a little bit of work in the CAM scheduler. It kind of knows, um, it has a, uh, the adaptive CAM scheduler has a quota system in it. Um, and it will just return not how much the device can do, but how much of the quota is left. Um, and so I've, I've used this um, to start to implement running buffs. Um, it currently works, but it tends to schedule too many buffers still. So the, the, the code needs some enhancement uh, to um, 
not do that. I'm not exactly sure why I'm doing that. So that's it, just a bug in my code, though. Um, the adaptive I/O scheduler, its estimate is the, the limiter right now, but it could also be um, a dynamic limit from what it estimates. And you know, that's, the, again, the hard problem. If I'm doing I/O to the disk, how do I know too much is too much? So there's some problems with this work. Um, normally, I like my problem slide to be shorter, but you know, I'm, I haven't worked through a lot of these problems. Um, like I've said several times, recognizing what saturated is and backing off is, is a hard problem. The network guys have been trying to do congestion control for 30 or 40 years, and they keep changing based on how the network changes um, and based on um, you know, what their notion of good or bad is. Um, so a similar body of work um, doesn't seem to have been published for the, um, for disks. A lot of people are doing the work. You see press releases talking about, you know, innovative algorithms and different <coughs> vendors, um, disk systems, but nobody seems to be publishing or I've not been able to access that in the literature. If people know of things in the literature that aren't simulations in some Java uh, thing that a bunch of grad students have done, I would love to hear about that. Um, I've also not done analysis for starvation and other unfair behavior. Oh, yes. Um, with the lowest level uh, driver of the device. Yes. Yeah, you can tell when you're totally saturated. But that's not a, a, the most useful thing to do to get the best performance. What you want to do is you, say, you want to say, um, <clears throat> at 100 megabytes a second, I'm totally saturated. And I get crappy performance. But I know at 95, I'm great. So I'll never do more than 95, and I'll be good. But how do you know that and, and figure that out dynamically, particularly when you have large swings in performance for some of the crappier consumer-grade SSDs that we use? So that, that is the basis of you know, all saturation is what happens to the latency. And what do you mean by getting longer? Does that mean the average gets longer? Does that mean the 99th percentile gets longer? Does that mean the max over a period of time gets longer? There's a number of ways you can approach it. And I'd hope to explore those and present different numbers on how well each of those worked. But I ran out of time. A failing device? Uh, I can't characterize that in a single way because devices fail in so many different ways. Never the, well, yeah, and, it, and it, it'll depend. If it's a, if it's a flash drive um, and starting to fail, it might be doing a bunch of retries internally to try to sift the data out, which has have one profile. Um, and a hard disk failing, it's going to try a few times and then return an error. So it, it, it'll vary. Yes? Yeah, so being one of those network guys that we're talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have some networks where it's just a you know a brutal color, and you know is, is your design or, or can, you, can you do what? What I'm trying to say is in, in networking, we're, we're going to separate the two kids. We're going to say, okay, these guys are, you know, we're going to sense the length mm -hmm. because it's drop rate. It's just the driver is a drop, and these other lengths, the driver to saturation is you know, a variation in the project. Um, is there some, such a <clears throat> I haven't noticed that in the data I've looked at, okay. different failure modes. However, um, I've tried to design things to be flexible so that as different things drive, I've got IOPS versus bandwidth. But with networks, you say I have a 20 gig link or a 10 gig link, or you measure a bandwidth product, uh, a bandwidth delay product to the remote host. Um, and similar things kind of exist for disks, but don't. I have a six gigabit link to the disk, well, but I can only do, use um, three gigabits of that for this particular operation, um, unless I'm doing too much, and then, the, you know, then it drops to one gigabit, maybe. So um, the things that trigger 
the saturation, I think, are going to be different with storage. But I think the concepts will be very similar. I have a disk I can be wide open with, maybe limited by some known characteristics versus something's really slowing this down. I don't know what, but I know what the number is. It's, you know, I've been able to measure it to be this particular thing. And a similar, talking with um, our network guys, Randall Stewart and such at Netflix, um, it's a similar thing as going on in the congestion control stuff. Um, and I'm looking for more papers uh, in that area as well to see which, you know, what are the, what are the techniques are applicable to storage that, uh, you know. So even pushing the analogy to quality of storage. Mm -hmm. Somehow, you know, you have not a band communication in those buses Right, and in other discussions, um, I had, we went off on a half hour tangent about quality of service. Well, this could be used to implement quality of service. You just put the layer above GEOM that looks up the process and goes, oh, you get this quality or that process, you get that quality, and you return those results up, and then the upper layers um, adjust accordingly. I thought it was a little hand wavy because the buffer daemon is aggregating things from a number of different sources, and it would have to keep go no, to keep going through the list and say, schedule this. Oh, no, I can't. OK, that doesn't mean I can't schedule anybody. Let's try the next one, because it has different credentials and might be allowed through if we did quality of service or um, try to do rate limiting at this layer. I don't know if this is the right layer to do that, but um, you know, that quality of service is, is, is another way you can look at this. Um, the CAMIO scheduler says, I, the, the adaptive part says, I want to slow this these, uh, these write IOs down because I measured this read IO taking too long. That's its simple-minded notion of congestion. So it reduces the quality that the writes get in order to preserve the quality of the reads on a global basis. It doesn't care who's doing them. So, um, <clears throat> Any other questions on this or yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You could. That's correct. Um, the reassignment of uh, backing store from device to device, depending on the capacity and what's dirty, uh, I hadn't thought of. That's a, that's a very interesting notion. I had thought. Um, I have a peer interaction with the buffer demons minimal because um, if the buffer demon needs to free a lot of dirty pages is a good strategy for that to look for the ones that have the most capacity and, and the shortest time um, quantum and schedule as many as possible to those and some others to, you know, for fairness and to prevent starvation. Um, and that's an open question. You know, it seems like it would be a very good idea that we could um, you know, get rid of memory pressure faster by writing to the fastest devices. But then does that swamp the devices and make them slower? I don't know. Thanks. That's, that's a very good question. That's <clears throat> right. And speaking of ZFS, um, it uses the ARC, which is a completely parallel buffer cache to everything I've talked about today. But that, that huh? And yeah. So, um, but it too could benefit from these hints up. You know, it schedules one to all of them. And then it can look for one with the most capacity to do next or something. This device, I 
I can queue five or 10 to this one, and two to this one, and six to this one, and eight to this one, and then wait for everything to return. Okay, I should have turned off my network, but you know. I'm doing the question slide anyway. No, nobody calisade me this year. Yay! <laughs> uh, Martin. We would love such devices, particularly if the copy from the storage device to the network device could happen with TLS encryption in between without going through uh, host memory. We would love that. We would, in fact, if anybody has vendors that are trying to sell them to them, email me. We, they might be able to sell it to us. Maybe not. We're kind of picky, but we would love to have devices like that is, is the short answer. Um, and work that I um, uh, have seen people talk about in bars, and I was drinking at the time, so I don't remember who was talking about it, was um, doing the same, the, the same thing on the network side. Um, they were doing really well, and they were just trying to do that on uh, the storage side as they were um, replicating data from a failing drive to a non-failing drive or you know doing low-level um, uh, operations like that and currently the only th way on FreeBSD to do that is to have a RAID cart that does it internally to the RAID cart as far as I know and if, if, if there are innovative ways to do that I would love to, to find out other other questions Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much for uh, joining. So for anybody that didn't have a chance to grab a bike, there is for the left side on the down portion. So we have to be back here around 12.30 for the next one. Okay, there's food outside. You have six minutes to grab it. <laughs> <laughs>